All right, so I'm going to do a video about two things you may or may not have heard of. One of them is called imposter syndrome, and the other is Dunning-Kruger. And um, I, I've learned about these uh, through the years. They're not something that I knew while I was working. They're something I kind of picked up on after I started helping people learn as a mentor. And um, actually, uh, Dunning-Kruger was brought to me by one of the people that I mentored who had a psychology degree. In fact, I, I described it as not knowing what you don't know. And he goes, oh, you mean Dunning-Kruger. So I'm very grateful to have had him in my community. In fact, I feel sort of selfish sometimes because my community brings so much to the table. So first of all, let's start with imposter syndrome. And the reason we're talking about these two things is because they are the two extremes. The two extremes in thinking that you have as you're going about your learning process, like when you're doing your stuff. So the first one is imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, I'm just going to search for it. I haven't done any preparation here. I just want to get this done. So here we go. Imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern in which one doubts one's accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud, despite the external evidence to, of their competence. Uh, those experiencing this phenomenon remain, remain convinced that they are frauds and that they do not deserve all that they have achieved. So that's imposter syndrome. That means you're good and you don't know it. You have skills and you don't know it. You go in for a job interview and you say, oh, you apologize. I'm sorry, I don't have the skills you need. And you actually do. Okay, this is imposter syndrome. This is the one end of the spectrum. And we're going to talk about later about how come having imposter syndrome is something you need to overcome, but it's actually a really, really good symptom. If you're having imposter syndrome, it means you're doing something really right about your learning. That means that you're learning in a way that doesn't artificially inflate your sense of accomplishment, which is the opposite. We're going to talk about that now. So, so the other problem people have, and this is the one that's really hard to, to encounter when you, when you find people who have this. It's actually super annoying. And I'm going to spell this wrong. I know it, but I hope um, you know our search engine will help us out here. So Dunning-Kruger. The Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect in the field of psychology is a cognitive bias. That means, you know, in your mind when you think. Bias in which people assess their cognitive ability as greater than it is. Let me say that again. So Dunning-Kruger effect is when you think you know and you actually suck. Anybody ever meet anybody like this? <laughs> we, all, we run into them all the time, right? So, and by the way, as when I talk about these things, I'm always asking myself, am I, am I an imposter syndrome right now? Or am I beating myself up? I mean, am I beating myself up with imposter syndrome? Or is this Dunning-Kruger effect? So once again, the contrast is imposter syndrome. Oh, I'm nothing. I don't know anything. But you actually do. And Dunning-Kruger is, no, I know everything. I'm God's gift to the earth. And you actually suck. You're really bad and you don't know it. Extremely dangerous. So why are these two psychological truths uh, about us so important to understanding how you learn and what you're going to do with your learning? Okay. And this is, this is really, really key. So um, and I, I want to tell you about this in, in story form. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the story of two people who learn in two different ways and the result. And, and at the end of the result of this, you'll, you'll be able to understand some of my position on the methods of learning and the tools that you choose to, learn, to use for your learning. Okay, so the first one is, the first, let's say the first person, I, um, this person, um, decides to go, they say, I really want to learn to code. And so they do a search, learn to code. And we'll just do this for fun here. Learning to code. How can I learn to code the fastest? And they get, they get inundated with a ton of stuff, you know, learn to code here, learn to code here. And look at there's code Academy. Oh, this looks really good. They maybe read the news on it. I'm going to turn my chat off for a second, guys. They maybe read the news on it. It's like, join the millions. They're learning to code and getting jobs. Oh, this sounds really awesome. And ooh, it's got a web interface. And all I have to do is answer questions and fill out and fill out forms and, and have it test my code for me and tell me whether I'm wrong or not. Okay. Maybe you're going to find something like Free Code Camp. And I'm not going to review these today. I'm just going to tell you them, about them in my story. Ooh, Free Code Camp. Let's do this. Res responsive web design. Ooh, gosh, look at this. It's got these really great these things. It's, ooh, I can read about it and I can go do my first lesson. Ooh, wow, what's this? This is really awesome. 
wow, look, I'm coding. I'm coding. I'm going to run all my tests. Oh, I got it wrong. What do I need to do here? Okay. To pass this test on this challenge, change your H1 element to say, hello world. Okay. Well, that sounds cool. All right. So I'll do this. All right. Hello world. Run the test. Did I get it right? Yes. I get it right. I'm a good person. I'm awesome. All right. So I need to save your bread. No, I don't want to do any of that. Okay. This didn't bother to tell you, by the way, about the form of an HTML page or where it's used or where it's placed or the use of the web and where the web came from. It doesn't give you anything else. But what what, what has this person that I'm pretending to be right now, what have, what have they got? They've got this this sort of artificial feeling of success. Because, because why? Because they beat the tool. They beat this one thing. It's a, it's a sort of an antagonistic relationship between you and the learning tool. You know, you are taking a moment, you're saying, hey, I figured this out. I'm a smart person. And then you go on to the next thing. And then you get that one right. And then you get that one right. And then you get that one right. And at the end of it, you get what? You get a big, shiny certificate that you can print out and put on your wall. And it says, huzzah, I have learned web design. But there's a big problem with that. You've learned almost no web design. You've learned how to beat the tool. You've learned how to fix, figure it out. And I know this because I talked about it on stream last night, but this is, this is what happens. I have people come to me, brilliant people, and they say, Mr. Rob, I got my certificate. I didn't even finish the lessons. I'm like, how'd you do that? Oh, I hacked it. I did blah, blah, blah. I said, I think that's in violation of their trust certificate thing. I said, no, but isn't that cool? I can just totally do that. I'm like, yeah. Okay. What have they learned? They've learned to beat the system. And what I'm, ex what I'm describing to you, this situation of pitting the learner versus the tool, versus the test, versus the teacher, that approach inevitably is a fail. And unfortunately, it's in all of our stuff. It's in everything, right? It's like me versus the teacher. My ex-wife got a C in her Spanish class. She went up, talked to her teacher, came back with an A. Several tears were shed. I was like, how was that possible? I was kind of pissed. Because what did she do? Did she learn any extra Spanish in that hour where she was crying to her teacher? No. She learned how to manipulate the system. And, and if you look at our testing system, and I'm going to avoid a rant here. I promise it's really hard. But if you look at our entire world, it's all about, can I beat the certificate? Can I beat the degree? Can I beat the system? It's never, can I win myself? What if it's not antagonistic? So the problem with this scenario is that it produces people with massive Dunning-Kruger effect. And I don't have to tell you this. You, you look around and you will find a dozen programs of people giving out trophies, giving out certificates, giving out whatever. Right, and I, I I don't think I can show the SNL skit without getting demonetized. But there, but I suggest you go look at it. But there's an SNL skit. It's called um, I'll do a search for it. It's called uh, "You Can Do Anything," and it's from Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live. Okay, so this is on stream. This is your homework. Go watch this incredibly funny video. I mean, and the video um, "You Can Do Anything." It's a, it's, it's, it's got, um, uh, uh, Rad, uh, uh, Daniel Radcliffe on it from Harry Potter. And they, it's like a talk show where they pretend to go onto the talk show and it brings on, um, uh, a bunch of people who really don't know anything, who have gotten famous through YouTube or whatever. And they think they know all this stuff and they actually don't know anything. And, and they, they, they kind of poke fun at a bunch of the things. I went to a school with no grades. I, you know, <laughs> it's just super funny. I really encourage you to go watch it. It's a good way to laugh at it. But this, this is kind of making fun of, of Dunning-Kruger and, and how dangerous it is. There's more insidious um, and dangerous um, effects of Dunning-Kruger. For example, uh, uh, I believe our current president, Mr. Trump, um, is completely a raving mad lunatic full of Dunning-Kruger. Um, you know, he's the best at everything. Well, he obviously isn't. It's impossible. So, you know, and it's, it's very, very dangerous. And so I, I want to talk about the effects of both of these later, but at first I want to come back. So I'm going to come back to that. We're going to come back to the, the effect on you and the world of both of these kind of extremes. But I, first I want to talk about imposter syndrome. So here's, here's the other scenario. So in this scenario, 
you are trying to learn to code and you, you, you think to yourself, well, gosh, I don't know how to code, but um, I, I, I really don't even trust myself to go do a search about how to learn how to code. I mean, you start out with imposter syndrome. You start out doubting yourself. You start out with, oh, you know, I, I know, I, I think I can do it. I really believe I can do it. But I, I'm not confident in my own ability to even search for how to do it. So I know what I'll do. I'll go find somebody I know who's done it. And you can probably tell that this is my bias. So you go out into the, your world and you make a, 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 a trustful con connection with somebody, maybe somebody you already trust, your Thanksgiving dinner or something, and you're, you're talking to somebody. Say, I know you're in tech. Hey, tell me about that for a second. How did you get into it? And if it's somebody you trust, a lot of times people will grandstand if you ask them that. Um, I'm, no, I'm no exception. I do it too. And you have to like bring them back down to earth and say, okay, well, what do you, you know, really nail them down and say, well, what, what do you recommend that I do to get started? And if you, if you ask that of somebody who is a professional and, and then you are like, you know, they're like, they, honestly, a lot of these professionals will not have ever asked this question. And it's funny because I'm, I'm going to own something here. When I was railing on Nano for the last five years, this last, since I was streaming and I was watching other people use Nano very effectively, I had to force myself to go back and remember, how did I learn VI? And I dug up a memory that I had totally forgotten for five years, where I used Pico, Joe, and I don't think Nano was around, but I'd used it for a good year and a half on the Unix system, because that was the editor that came with our email editor called MUT, which is a command line editor, a terminal editor. And so I, I told myself, oh, you know, this is going to be, oh, you should just learn VI. And I've been telling people that, and, I, and frankly, I'm, I'm ashamed to say it, but I look, I've looked down on people who are not using VI, who are using Pico and Nano, and that's wrong, dead wrong. And it's, this has nothing to do with Dunner Kruger. This is just plain old arrogance, right, on my part. But when you go back as somebody who's helping other people and you ask yourself, how did I actually learn this stuff? Um, you have to really dig and you might not remember. So I tell you that because when you ask some random person that you trust uh, how they learned what they, they learned, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to brag about how awesome they are. And they're going to talk about all the things they did because you're interested in them and you're showing sincere interest. You you're, you're also have your own self-interest, but you're showing. So what happens is they end up sharing all of that but then when you, you really have to pin them to, the, I'm saying, you have to pin them to the wall and say, no, tell me exactly how you learn this step by step. And you force them to go into their brain and dig back the history and say, well, you know, honestly, I started out as a front end developer messing around with web pages. I really liked putting stuff on the screen. And frankly, if I think back even farther than that, I really liked coding, you know, basic on my Atari 800 computer when I was in so, so old. So, so if you, it's, it's a little tough to help, to help your potential mentors find their, their way, because as someone who's trying to learn, you have to help, you have to kind of coach them through being a mentor. And that means being honest with themselves and not everybody can. So that's also a lesson to people who want to be mentors. You need to be really honest with yourself and be able to say, no, this is how I learned this. So we're talking about imposter syndrome right at this point. So imposter syndrome is, is doubting yourself. And you're going into it doubting yourself, but now you can have the confidence to say, okay, I'm going to go find somebody who knows this stuff. And it doesn't have to be Mr. Rob, and I mean, but it can be anybody. I mean, this is not a sales pitch. This is, this is a way for you to find your way. So you can find that person. It can be somebody. And, and where, where can you find somebody if you can't find them? Well, you have this wonderful internet now, right? Um, you can go find people on YouTube, you can find people on Udemy, you can find random people, but I'll tell you someplace that's very, very reliable. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, this is a little tougher because you can't make personal contact with them. But if you are completely unable to make personal contact with somebody, which is kind of hard these days with the internet because there's so many people, then books. You go to books. And the reason books are a thing, even though so many things about books I don't like, the reason they're a thing is because they're written by people who've come from a place of experience and authority and have had, the most, from, for the most part, they've been able to convince a publisher to put them out. Now, there's, it's a racket, and some people get published who have no business being published, of course. But you can, use, you can kind of lean on the book. So 
depending on the book. Now, the problem with that is you also might not trust yourself to pick the right book. So you have to find, you have to ask around and find somebody who, who you know, agrees with the book. Read the reviews of a book. And don't take the one that's the most popular. Take the one that's the most popular, and I just had a problem with this, actually. So Eloquent JavaScript was brought to my attention um, after I, I had kind of decided on another book because I'd reviewed several. And it's free, and it's good. I mean, it's good. In fact, I think it's much better for beginners. So, um, so you know, you might have to do some research on your own. But let's, let's, let's finish on this imposter syndrome thing. So, so let's say, so finally you get a book or you get a mentor, and you start working. And what is the number one way that you're doing your learning? You're doing stuff. You're reading the book and you're like, well, gosh, they don't have exercises in this one. So I should probably try it out myself. So you find a way to do that. If you're me, you're on your Mac. When I learned web development back when I was a Russian major, first technical thing I did, I mean, coding. And I in text edit, I coded Perl in text edit. And then I, I learned about the command line for the first time. And I typed my command line thing, and I saw my little Perl program run, and I was addicted. It's just like it's like this this lame black and white terminal, you know, on this on this this Mac that I had made a desk for out of cardboard boxes. That is not an exaggeration. We had one couch. I was really poor, and we had you know a baby and everything. And I I said I'm going to teach myself this web stuff, and I did. In fact, I taught myself Perl, and within, and there was nobody. There was no, nothing on that. There was the internet. So I would do the internet and I would read the spec. And that's another thing I would do. I went directly to the sources. So a lot of the times people are afraid to do this. They see a specification and they're terrified. They see uh, the source of a web page and they're terrified. But there's a lot of people who agree about this, including TJ is one of my favorite people to talk about for who made Express. If you don't know about that, that's a node, big node thing. He now is a Go programmer. And he um he gives the advice go look at other people's stuff and copy it practice it make your own tweak it make your own version you might even end up with a better one that's his exact words so this method of learning is far less structured and it's terrifying it's especially terrifying to people who come from traditions where everything is given to them you know, and it's unfortunate because we have this tendency. This is how we learn when we're kids. Um, Sir Ken Robinson talks about this. We are creative learners when we're young. We experiment. We try things out. That's how animals learn. That's how everything learns naturally. And it, and to use Ken's words, his exact words are, are, this is beaten out of us through our education system. Our system says, no, you, you, don't, you can't explore there. You have to give me the right answer on paper for this and this and this. So this experiential learning is, is, is looked down upon because it's, it's way, way, way too loosey-goosey. And so that makes organizations uncomfortable. And, and frankly, they have to figure out a way to measure your learning. And so that means, you know, we, we can't do that unless we put you in nice rows and we send you down the, you know, the automotive mechanics line and, and, you know, now you passed and some, we get some duds and we throw you out and chop you up like baby chicks. But, you know, the rest of you get to be you know, mechanics or whatever. So um, Ken Robinson, if you want to talk about education, um, has written a book um, out of their minds, and he talks a lot about um, taking back your creativity, but 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 also taking back your learning and learning to not be afraid of it. Imposter syndrome comes from fear, and there's a lot of philosophers who would argue that the one goal of life must be on learning is overcoming fear. Period. There's been movies made on this. That, that that is the goal of life is overcoming our fears and our fears are built into our brain because because as as animals we you know we could imagine fear and the, the things that we're afraid lived so you know it's a tough thing because it's built into us and i'm really happy that people on the stream have showed me alan watts he talks about this a lot um so i encourage you those are all people to go to to try to address your imposter syndrome um but let's get back to my example the example of the person who's losing through imposter syndrome pretty soon so, and I'm going to use a specific example. Somebody who's an artist. Um, my son is an artist, and I want to show you some of his art, um, if I can find it. And um, so this, I'm going to really bust it. Can I just say how much I hate Wix? <laughs> I really hate it. So 
a lot of times, all right, we, you know, we're going to help Gordon out here. So he started out just doing little pixel art. Uh, to be fair, he did. He was not interested in coding at all, but he really liked the pixel art, and he just went with it. So he's got some um, some digital painting he's done from his iPad, and I'm um, just going to show you this stuff. This is how far he's come. I mean, in like six or seven years, he's been doing stuff for a very long time. He has an entire um, he has an entire poster series, I think. But yet, when you talk to him, oh, my stuff's not good. My stuff's not good. It could never be used anywhere professionally. I'm like, dude, you could make posters of this stuff, not to mention making a game. And he gets really excited about it. He's like, well, there's, yeah, I got, I got, I got, I got this whole world in my mind. I've got like all of these races and, and where their backstories are and, and where they come from and everything. So, and, and he's created this amazing, amazing art. And he doesn't think he's anything. You know, and if you, if if you're me, I'm looking at him. I, I wish I had that skill at his age. I I, I was the guy who knew that I didn't have skill. <laughs> I had a, I don't know if it was imposter syndrome or just reality, right? And we should probably talk about that. How do you tell the difference? How do you tell the difference between just being realistic with your your skill set and being saying that you're really bad? This is, by the way, if you don't know, this is inspired by, um, was it War Warframe? I think. Anyway, so some really great art. So let's conclude our example of the imposter. Okay, so the imposter says, um, I'm going to go back. It's more fun to look at his art than it is my, like, my nothing thing. The imposter says, I don't know anything. Because why? No one's told them how good they are. They've been quietly working. A lot of times they're not even working with anybody else. So, um, and, and they're making amazing, amazing things. I mean, they're making truly amazing things. I think, I don't know, but I would say that TJ himself, because he made some of his most amazing creations while he was doing it, his, his, he shared this online, um, you know, largely, you know, with, without much to show for it as open source. And I don't, he probably felt like, oh, this isn't that big. Well, he made some of the biggest libraries ever used. So, so this is imposter syndrome and it's, and it's, you know, worst. But here's okay. So we that's a lot of talk. So I want to I want to talk about um, the 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 problems with both of these and the benefits of them. So um, so if you I, let me just go back here. I'm trying to figure out what to show y'all. Y'all, I might just have to watch the Matrix while I do it. <laughs> so uh, that might be a way to do this. So where's my IRC? I'll pull that back up. So what is the deal. Why um, do you want imposter syndrome more than you want Dunning-Kruger? And I imagine most of you understand this already. So it's going to be just me talking. But imposter syndrome means that you have a lot, a lot of skill. And you haven't talked to the right people to validate that skill for you. Or in some cases, particularly in the case of artists, there isn't a forum for you to have that validated unless you're showing in a museum, your stuff's no good. Unless you are, you know, being picked up by the latest game art developer, you're nobody. You know, unless you are having people constantly rave about your stuff. Okay, so there are successful artists in the past who are in, in the present who do this without being affected by imposter syndrome. They are, you know, they they are able to say, no, I am making this art for me. And when I talked to my son the other night, that's exactly what his response was. I'm doing this for me. This is my world. This is in my head. I don't, but when you ask him, well, it, when you, when he starts to broach the topic of having him doing it for a career, it's like, oh, my stuff wouldn't be good for that. No, 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 no. But he still does it because he does it for himself. And I, I really, really, really want to punch on that point. People who are producing value for themselves, scratching their own itch, as they say in the coding, are producing value. Whether it's something as simple as an XKCD search tool, or, or you know, a Hello World thing, or an IRC bot, or, you know, uh, your own version of a simple version of a static site generator. Because you're scratching your own itch, you're making things that are valuable to you, you'll tend to do them more and you will learn better because the neurology says, the neuroscience on this is, if you're producing dopamine, 
That means if you're engaged in something you enjoy and you create, and in particular if it's creative, and coding is creative, don't let anybody ever tell you that it's not, then you will learn it better. You'll memorize it better. Now, contrast that with the antagonistic, the sort of hostile environment of learning when you're going against a system. It might be a challenge, indeed. That might be sort of fun. But ultimately, the, the system's either going to defeat you, in which case you're going to come away thinking you don't know anything and you're going to be really pissed, or, or you're going to defeat the system. But you're not experiencing the creative part of learning. You're not experiencing the, the personal ownership of learning. I don't like the word responsibility because that's not what it is. It should be pleasurable. So Watts, Alan Watts says that, that you know, skill, there is no pleasure without skill. It's impossible. And there, frankly, there's no learning without, you know, true, like, you, you, I, to be fair, I mean, there's no true learning without pleasure and learning, you know, enjoying it. But I think that you can actually learn skills that you don't necessarily enjoy. I mean, that, that's pretty proven. But, but you're, you know, you're going you're gonna to learn better if you enjoy it. Not if you're pitted against the test. So the reason that all of us stress out, so many of us stress out and fail on tests, and I am the worst at this, is because of these antagonistic relationship. I actually took an after-school course uh, for SAT prep, and these very intelligent people at the front of the class on the first day said, explained to us, this is not helping you improve your knowledge about taking this test. This is helping, this is specifically training you to beat this multiple choice test. And I went through six months of training to beat the test. I did pretty well. That is a failed system. And there's no way we can fix it. At least there's no way we can change that existing system. It has to be thrown out entirely. And there are people who believe me on this. So Ted Dintersmith, if you want to follow him on Twitter, um, Ken thinks we need a massive re overhaul. But we're starting to see the overhaul trickle in because what's happening is we are all helping each other learn now. The people who truly desire to learn are helping each other. And this is, this is manifesting itself in all of our open forms. Open learning, open curriculum is starting to be a thing. MIT, I learned guitar through MIT just by reading an open curriculum. Um, you know, we are now able to help each other through streaming, through Discord, through whatever. We can help each other. Some very, very kind people in Twitter, I reached out, helped me to get into the teaching area. They also helped me decide for myself that there's no way I was ever going to be um, a public school teacher, where I didn't, you know, it's another rant. But so the true learning is happening when you're taking ownership. And that means that you're being, you're creating your own learning environment. So the last thing about the imposter that I want to talk about is this. When the imposter is, is, is or the, the person in that scenario, when they're reading from a book, there's no system to tell them whether they're right or wrong. So let me, let me talk about that again. When they're reading from a book, there's no way for them to determine they're right or wrong. There might be an answer in the back of the book. There might be something else out there. But they're wondering to themselves, am I right here or am I wrong? So this is tough because there's no system. They can't lean on the system. So who do they lean on? And this is really key. So I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping this up. Uh, so the imposter has nothing, no system to learn on, uh, to lean on. So what they do is they, they have to become their own evaluation system. That means they have to internalize the nature of their learning. They have to learn how to learn. They have to take on this responsibility for their own learning from the very beginning. That means they have to check themselves and they develop practices that would otherwise be coded into a system. So Code Academy Free Code Camp, there are systems that do the checking for you. So they remove you, they remove that burden from you. And that is bad. Because as soon as they do that, you, do, you no longer are developing the very essential skill of self-evaluation. And if you are, do not develop the skill of self-evaluation, finding the right answers, finding out whether you're right or wrong, on your own, doing the research. If you do not develop that skill, you will never, ever become an independent learner. And so the great insidiousness of these systems, these antagonistic systems, whether they be Code Academy, Free Code Camp, or the SAT test, is that they replace this critical part of our learning process with a tool. 
And they do it because they think it will make us more efficient. And instead what it does is it robs us from the ability and the moment of learning for ourselves. And the, the interesting thing about self-evaluation is that when you do it properly, the, in fact, the this, this sickness that is imposter syndrome is someone who has not learned, they've learned how to do this skill, but they have not learned how to self-evaluate. So, so what happens is you have this disconnection. They, they learn really well. They learn the skill phenomenally well. But because they're lacking the ability to self-evaluate or they're lacking some reference material, and I'm kind of lumping it all together there, they automatically think that they don't know anything. So in, a, in, a, in some sense, you could say their testing system is broke. Their internal testing system is busted. It hasn't been built up. They built up the skill, but they haven't built up the ability for them to test themselves and assess their own ability. And so to me, that is critical. It is critical. And over the years, I have seen case after case after case of people not developing that. And so what do they do? They either learn to develop it or they accept that they can't develop it. And this is a huge tragedy. I've, I've, people do this. They run away from the responsibility for their own self-learning because they're too terrified of learning how to self-evaluate because we've been told we can't do this. And so what they do is then they, then they, 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 they throw money at a boot camp. And they think, they think that a, the boot camp is going to fix everything for them. And often the only thing the boot camp is giving them is, is a really immersive experience that promotes a lot, a lot, a lot of self-evaluation with a lot of personal mentoring and a lot of camaraderie. So the, you could say, you could hypothesize, I suppose, that the value of these things isn't even in the technical skills that are there, but it's in the ability, it's in, it's in this injection of self-confidence and, and self-evaluation and, and the skill of self-evaluating. And so you come away, a lot of people, not all, this is the problem with boot camps, right? Because the people for whom this does not work, I've, I've, I've met people, I told you about them at the pub, who come out of these boot camp situations and they can't get a job. And they, their learning stops. Why? Because they haven't, they haven't addressed that key piece of it. Now, unfortunately with boot camps, most of this one person that I've talked to, they came out of it and they still had imposter syndrome. So thank God they didn't have Gunning-Kruger. If they had Dunning-Kruger, we would have been in big trouble. And this is the reason that so many people coming out of boot camps are being you know, dropped or ignored from Silicon Valley and other places to say, we don't even want to talk to you, is because they've been injected with Dunning-Kruger. And in some cases, the worst of everything has been combined. So here's a scenario. We have somebody who goes through a boot camp. They don't learn to self-evaluate. They also don't learn the skills. I mean, I'm talking about a worst case here. This isn't everybody. But now they finished a boot camp, they got their gold star, and now what? Now they go to apply for a job, and they stick them in front of a system. You know, I had, I had a network engineer actually tell me about testing a person like this, sticking a, a CCNA in front of a, of a network device and saying, hey, go configure it, couldn't do it, froze. Had a certificate and everything, couldn't do it. What happens to that person? Well, when, when someone who doesn't know they don't know, and we'll go back and look for Dunning-Kruger, so let's talk about this, and this is the bad part of that. When someone who doesn't know they don't know, a Dunning-Kruger person, gets faced with reality, they have two choices, and there's an Adam Ruins, uh, there's a, I think it's called Becky Ruins, Adam Ruins Everything, and it takes on the idea that telling somebody they're wrong actually causes them to double down and want to punch you and, and become even more right, and it traces the, the cause of, our, of a lot of our societal problems right now because we just don't know how to, to come to the conclusion that we're wrong. Because when, you, when that person, but you know, in some cases, they melt down, right? They totally, totally melt down, and they, they can't, um, deal with it. And that's, that's cognitive dissonance. And um, cognitive dissonance is when cognitive dissonance uh, cognitive dissonance is, we'll read it, in the field of psychology, cognitive dissonance is the experience of psychological stress that occurs when a person holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, values, or participants, or participates in an action that goes against one of these three. According to this theory, when two actions or ideas are not psychologically consistent with each other, people will do all in the power to change them until they become consistent. 
I know all about this because I nearly went crazy leaving the Mormon church when I realized my reality was wrong. But that's another story for another day. The story that's at hand here is that when somebody who has Dunning-Kruger effect and doesn't know that they don't know is suddenly presented with their absolute suckage, how bad they are, they break down. And it's really, really sad. I, I saw this in my lab. I sent 40 people or so through Free Code Camp over the course of three months. I said, I really want to believe in this. I think this might be a thing. Let's give it a shot. It has the, some of the best JavaScript of all. I tested these people against themselves. I had them sit down and test themselves, and I gave them one challenge. I said, make a web page. Only two people did it. And those two people had repetitively done what I call the HTML5 challenge, you know, make an HTML page in under 60 seconds. They had done it at least 15 to 20 times before they did the free code camp stuff. So the repetition is what got them to learn it. Now, I had to suggest to them to do the repetition, and I had to give them the challenge. Sometimes um, we need to be jump-started on our self-learning, and that means be being usually being given a challenge or a project. Hey, go make this. Go learn how to do it. But it's, it's frankly, learning this way, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, just jump in and, and be a self-learner uh, without a little bit of help. But, but, it's, but I'm going to, here's my final conclusion. So it's much better for you to come out, of, to come out with this um, imposter syndrome. If you have imposter syndrome, it's more likely because you have been learning lots of awesome skills but have failed to develop your self-evaluation center of your brain or whatever that is. So, so you're not good at self-evaluating. You don't know how good you are. Okay, You're actually really good and you just don't know it because you haven't developed that. Now, and, but Dunning-Kruger is a, is a much more serious disease because this means that you have not developed the skills and you also have not developed the self-evaluation skill, the self-testing skill. So now you don't have the skills, you don't have a way to assess your own skills, and on top of all of that, you also think you have the skills. In fact, you probably have an inflated ego. And so you're going to go into interviews, you're going to go into things, and you're going to be all, all you know, egotistical or you're going to be overconfident. And the scary thing about this is that my, just me tell, talking to you about this means that you are very likely going to ask yourself all the time, Am I, do I have Dunning-Kruger? You could have imposter syndrome about having Dunning-Kruger, and that's kind of a fun like infinite loop. But, but really, the takeaway is this. Imposter syndrome, if you're going to have one of these, imposter syndrome is the better one because that means you can fix it. It doesn't mean that you're overconfident in your skills. You're not going to go kill somebody because you think you can do CPR and you really don't know how, right? Or the equivalent in any other industry. You, you're you going to go into this situation undervaluing your skills and maybe be forced to save somebody and save their life because you're fucking awesome at it. Sorry for the F word there. So that so imposter syndrome is, is is the lesser of the two, and it can be overcome more easily, and it has less damaging effects because when you evaluate your self evaluation part, you know pretty soon you're going to be like, wow, okay, I actually do know, and then you're going to bake that thing in, and then pretty soon now you know now you're an independent learner, and you you can go on through life. It doesn't matter how you learn because the way have you have learned instead of having this antagonistic system, instead of depending on some system to help you learn, you are now learning all the time in every way possible, just like, you know, Socrates would promote um, and with his parapoletics and, and all of the other people who walk around and, and, and you become like a lifelong learner, they call them. It's a kitschy term, but Dunning-Kruger people have to very, very gently be brought back down to earth. You know, and I have a problem with this. I have people who are extremely brilliant who don't know they don't know that they don't know, but they're brilliant in other areas. So they automatically project their brilliance onto something else and they suck. And it is very, very challenging to bring that person back to earth and maintain a trust relationship with them. 
And I'm just going to say the only way to do that is to is to require them to do a challenge. Let me give you an example. I had a, I had a person who was like a, a top seed, you know, in, in sporting events and everything. He was just really, really full of ego. He, he, you know, he did really well and all this thing. And I said, okay, fine, great. Let's. I need you to take a t- typing test for me. He goes, well, all my typing speed is seventy words a minute. I said, okay, awesome. Take a typing test for me. You know, let's let's see. Everybody else does, so you know, different. I had him take the typing test. You know, I don't need to do that. I went, why not? I mean, you type 70 words a minute, it'll take you like a minute or less to take the typing test. Just take the typing test and give me a result. You don't trust me? I'm like, well, no, it's not about trust, dude. I'm just having you do what everybody does. This is how we, this is how we do this. Can you, want, can you do this or not? No, I'm not doing it. I refuse to do that. I'm pretty sure this isn't going to work out. I'm like, me too, because you just failed my test. And it was before I, I allowed him to come in. He failed my test. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He was so full of Dunning-Kruger, he was disease-ridden with ego and Dunning-Kruger, that that my even broaching the topic that perhaps he couldn't be as good as he thinks he is made him explode in anger. And I was like... I'm sorry, you know, and I felt really bad because it was like it was like meeting somebody who was a leper who was going to die and not being able to help them. There was nothing I could do for this guy. And I deeply appreciated him as a person. Um I really did. I did. Um you know, it makes me sad to this day to tell this story. But but this person has been so told how awesome they are their whole life that that it has affected they have had Dunning Kruger about everything that they've done. And sometimes people like this uh, get into really major positions of power because they are so convinced how awesome they are that they can convince everybody else how awesome they are, but they suck. And I don't have to tell you that this is all over in the political system and everywhere else. These people are, so if you're going to help them, just don't be one, first of all. That's the first lesson. And number two, if you have to deal with people like this, you know, learn, learn some way to maintain trust. And the best way to do that is to do something that has nothing to do with them. So they're not being singled out. And unfortunately, that means some form of assessment. And assessment means testing and testing is, is part of this whole problem. So it's, it's, it's a tough challenge. The best way to do it is to have them do a minor challenge and then have them do it in your presence and have it, you know, maybe kind of de-emphasize the importance of it, but you know, and see how they do it. And the other, the other way to deal with this is to just walk away. You know, I hate to say that, but it means walk away, vote them out of power, you know, um, because that's really the only way to deal with it. So I, I would much rather have have people come to me or find people, you know, like my son and like several people in my group here who have done, who have imposter syndrome, because it means that they're approaching their learning properly. It means that their egos have not been overinflated through other means, uh, and they're, they're much more um, likely to learn on their own and to maintain their own learning. They're also much more appreciative of help in any form that it comes from me, from anyone else on the stream. And so they tend to be the people who have really figured the secret out of life, which is to be a lifelong learner and to never stop seeking and not, you know, impose your will on everyone because you obviously are the best at everything. You have the best words, you have the best typing speed, you have the best this. So that's the end of this video. So if you have imposter syndrome, don't despair. If you have Dunning-Kruger, you probably won't even accept that. I just told you you might have Dunning-Kruger. So this is fine. You'll just slough it off. You'll turn the video off and you'll go do something else <laughs> because, because your cognitive distance will save you from yourself. And it's a good thing you have that. that, that. But, um, but for the rest of you imposter syndrome people out there, huzzah, we'll find a way to balance our skills and have a modest... By the way, don't undervalue yourself. There, once you get rid of your imposter syndrome, you will start to do things like charge your value. You'll charge the money that you're that you're entitled to have for your effect. You know, surgeons really have put in a lot of time in, and we always undervalue our skills because they're easy for us. So, so eventually you'll find your middle way and your middle path, and may you find that way. And I'm here to help you. Um, if you do uh, want to do that, uh, you can join our community. Um, this is the plug thing I hate doing, but um, you can you can follow the YouTube videos. Um, you can listen to me. Um, some of these videos you may find are. 
they don't particularly have compelling graphics in them. My goal at some point is to um, add more compelling graphics and video. Maybe even you know at some point pay someone to to make some fun illustrations to go with my my words. Um, and I'm going to take some some questions from the IRC here. But if you want to just cut out, that's fine. Uh, okay, so um, I have the least amount of Dunning Kruger of anyone. <laughs> Uh, I don't accept any of this. Just kidding. <laughs> um, Rob, my okay, serious question. Could cert testing be a possible remedy to Dunning-Kruger since you can, can't can cry to the test to get an A like you can to a teacher? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to clip ahead and I'm going to answer that question on the video. So here's, here's a question from Zeros. He says, um, could cert certified testing be a possible remedy to Dunning-Kruger since you can't cry to the tester to get an A like you could to a teacher? Um, yes, but there are, it's throught with risk. Okay, so institutions that are online institutions that are skill-based and all that, um, they are relying heavily on certification. And I have another video called Why Certify, which you probably know about, that covers this danger. The, the certification game is a pro can be a problem because, like for example, um, let, let me let me do this by an example. So let's contrast two cases. Let's contrast the offensive security certification with the CompTIA security certification. Okay, so CompTIA, the same organization that's been lobbying against right to repair, and they're very evil. I mean, they're greedy bastards, and they're we all have to do it in some sense. The government requires that you have their specific certificates, so they have a monopoly on, on certificates. They have a test that is multiple choice. In fact, as far as I know, all of their tests are multiple choice. They're certification exams. And if I'm not if I'm not incorrect on this, I could probably well no. I don't I think it's I think it's College Board that does the SAT. So so you have these these um, sort of credential giving organizations. Uh, like CompTIA, like College Board, who have these multiple choice tests because the dollar, you know, the dollar value of the testing says that we have to do multiple choice. So I can go get a Linux certificate. You know, Linux Essentials is 40 multiple choice questions. I could never even boot Linux when I could get a certificate. And if you don't believe me, you know, that that, that story I told about the network thing is that that's, they did somebody who answered all the questions and never actually done it. So certifications that are based on bad assessment methods, such as multiple choice, are seriously bad because they really, really pump up your Dunning-Kruger. And yes, they're, they're somewhat better than crying to the teacher, but I still think most people who try to cry to their teacher are going to be put down. The teacher's going to be like, I'm sorry, no, you know, because they're going to be able to assess you in person. So even though some people can be manipulated who are corrupt, I don't care how righteous you think you are. If you give an A to somebody after they after they had a C on a test that was a subjective test, that's bad. Now, if it, I've gone in and argued my case and changed my grades on calculus tests many times, but it was because I showed them that their evaluation of my problem was wrong. And they said, oh yeah, we made a mistake in the correction of the test. So you have humans involved in all the processes. And so you have people like CompTIA and places like that who think we have to remove the human element out of it because if we don't, they're not going to be able to make uh, an accurate assessment. And so we rely on computers and multiple choice tables and all this stuff to do the assessment. And for ma in many ways, that can be done correctly. It's just a lot of work. And so then I want to take it to the example of offensive security. Offensive security, uh, from the very first day, created a certification that required at first, I believe, they had to go into the testing center. But their testing center was a lab. It was a computer lab. And you had a certain amount of time to perform certain tasks that you would normally re be required to do on the job. And their certification has remained focused on skills-based assessment so that now when you do it, you have a VPN connection. That means you can remotely connect into their lab rather than flying to wherever they are. And you can do the things you're being tested on. They give you a time limit and they say, go do this. We see the same sort of thing in some of the better um, hiring policies and hiring evaluations. Well, they'll put you on the job and they say, in fact, um, there's a company up the street, Coin. This is what they do. They give you, um, they give you a, a week-long project. They give you an assignment. They don't limit you in how you go about figuring it out. And they say, come back in a week and show us what you got. And then be prepared to talk about what you've done and why you chose to do this. 
And that, to me, that's the perfect way to do it. It's it's a lot more labor intensive, and it's 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 very very hard to, you know, what's the word commodify, because because you can't, you know, you can't you can't just run a paper through a thing, and so you can't send five hundred people through a testing center every week. And and this gets back to the point. The reason the whole thing screwed up is because, like Sir Ken says, we have started to industrialize education and and education at the fundamental level is not an industrializable thing and that's Ted Dentra Smith's position as well it's just like we have to move back to our roots on this and this is where I'm, I'm somewhat conservative you know in the sense of you know true learning happens but it's an exchange of information between two people at the end of the day and the fewer links you can remove in that chain or that that communication the better in the old days it was one on one let me show you how to how to how to make fire. <laughs> Let me show you how to crack this coconut open. And you see, this is still a thing. In fact, I watched a documentary about um, the evolution of humanity, and um, and it actually suggested that the one significant difference between the human species and all other species is that we have the ability to generationally transfer learning. So we've been given a gift of being able to capture our learning, and instead of doing it one on one like every other species does, and it's fun they go through that. Opening a coconut was one of the ways that they talked about. Um, you know, all species teach something to each other, to their to those that are alive. But our species, according to them, is the only one who's that's figured out how to transfer learning from one generation to the next. And that has allowed us to outpace every other species, like ridiculously quickly. And it continues to be with the internet, you know, all of human evolution is just getting, super, you know, it's getting supercharged by our, our connectivity and our ability to archive our learning and share it with others without being there. So why does all of that have to do with whether you should, whether cert testing could get rid of the problem? Um, I, it's a, that's a tough question because it really depends. I mean, if, if it's a one-on-one situation and you actually deserve an A and got a C, and you can express yourself to another human and explain why that is, then yeah, I think it's probably okay. In this particular case, the case I threw my ex-wife under the bus, it's not that was not the case. You know, this is somebody who really did. It's tough because you have subjective topics too that you're trying to help people learn. Art, for example, anything. How do you how do you grade them? The whole grading system is bogus. What is it for? I mean, seriously, what is what is a grade for? You know, you get a 95% for five years and what? how much percentage of non-mastery do you now have because you didn't get a full mastery? If you want to hear about more about that, um, Salman Khan wrote that in his book uh, from Khan Academy. He says that true learning is only mastery to learning, to is, is only mastery learning, that there there shouldn't be an ABCD and all of that. It shouldn't be um, C gets the degree. It should be you either mastered it or you don't pass. Pass, fail, done. And... And that's actually how it was before, right? Um, you either passed or failed. You know, you learned it or you died. So, um, anyway, that's just my my thoughts on that. I think it's a more complicated question. I do think certs could help, but I don't think certs are are the answer in themselves. It it really really depends on the assessment, and that's really the rub. the The thing that that no one is, well, in my to my think my thinking. I mean, I'm. I'm not in the academic educational community, so I, I may not be aware of, of things that are happening there. Um, but they're, the thing that they, they keep missing, as far as I'm concerned, is that they have a they keep focusing on how to be more cost effective with their assessments, and that is not the right way to go about it. The way to go about it is how to make more accurate assessments. In some cases, the assessment that people are given, they're not even given. I mean, I think that's just totally messed up assessments are for the individual you don't you don't give somebody an assessment if they can't do a review of that assessment for themselves that's just insane so this idea because the assessment's being given to somebody else to prove that they're good for the job and it's secret we can't give you your results because you'll share the results with somebody else and they'll beat the system and then it's the whole antagonistic relationship the whole lack of trust in the system is the biggest fail and it's costing us billions of dollars because we have to put all of this stuff in in place to to replace you know what would be fine if you trusted each other 
And you don't get trust without a personal relationship. And so the idea that the best learning system in the world could be people teaching people and people learning to learn on their own and eliminating the word teacher from our vocabulary and having mentors and facilitators, people who are giving you advice and helping you on your path, but you're the boss of your learning. If we could move everyone in society to starting to learn that way and think that way, we wouldn't need the education system that we have now. But it's a huge topic, and you don't get to try that unless you form a new civilization with new rules. And that ain't happening until we go to another planet. <laughs> so, you know, and even then it might not happen, right? Because we'll take all of our old habits with us. Thankfully, a lot of, a lot of states are allowing, um, you know, homeschooling laws and things like that that are allowing us to avoid this. So, so we are starting to see um, a change happen, and, um, and that's good. So um, I'm going to wrap up this video and take a break. Um, and I, I appreciate everybody participating.